Maybe you can. Thank you everyone. Hi. Um, oh, just moved on too quickly. Um, so, what me and Jakob are going to talk to you guys... Oh, it's all going wrong now. May I have yep. Um, what me and Jakob are going to talk about today is just about um, using eBPF offload uh, with uh, CLS BPF and XTP and pushing it to hardware. Um, as you can see, I've just pointed out a little nick there. Um, that is uh, MPU based NIC. So what we've done is actually it's almost a combination of the approaches you guys see, have seen so far today. Is take an MPU and actually put it onto a NIC um, and then run that. So it's really aimed right at the compute node here, what we're doing. Um, this was kind of the motivation. This is where we came from. Um, the fundamental problem when you're doing what we're doing as a MPU based NIC company is that um, you know, fully programmable hardware could do anything. Um, so we run into this problem of what I call whack-a-mole, which is where we end up with sort of custom code for custom purposes over and over again. Because you end up with a client, client wants to offload X, you write code, client uses code, um, you end up patching up kernels, you end up uh, spending a lot of time. Now that's difficult for us because um, it's hard to get the, um, the actual customers to buy into it because they know it's sticky because once they're using it, they're kind of stuck with it. Um, and then it's huge risk for us because we have to spend a lot of time working on it. And then at the last moment, a client could say, no, we don't want this. So that kind of pushed us to actually think, actually, instead of keeping on thinking what we should offload next, what we should offload next, we should start thinking about how we do this offload. Um, and that's kind of why we ended up with uh, BPS. Um, why? It's a, it's a well-defined framework. The instruction set maps well to what our um, sort of our risk-based CPUs on our MPU can do. Um, it's tightly defined, but actually still highly stateful, which helps for us. We've got a lot of memory on our chip, um, and we've got and we've got actually quite low latency, so we're able to use that well uh, with the BPF model. Um, and also there's some sort of intrinsic parallelization with it, which really helps us, seeing as we've got you know, a huge amount of cores running at once. Um, and then the final point is actually it's, it's gaining traction. It's used in TC, it's used in XDP. These are great hooks for us to use. I mean, you've seen one we've been speaking the last couple of days. People suggest things like, you know, I think Tom mentioned GRO earlier. Um, there was a discussion earlier about you know, whether we could use uh, BPF for various other things. It's been mentioned in the context of IPVS. Um, there's so many different ways we can use this. And suddenly, instead of us having to go and whack moles, guys can write their BPF code for their kernel, and then we can just transparently offload that. And that's really the motivation, and that's where we came from. And that's why we think this is an approach which is interesting. Um, target architecture, just want to quickly run through actually what the NFP MPU is. Um, so we've got a large group of fully programmable, what we call flow processing cores. Uh, these are small risk CPUs. Um, they're arranged into general purpose islands where you've got 12 of them on each island. Um, there's also some specialist islands which can do things like crypto, um, some sort of memory accesses, a few other different types of things. But the, the, main, the main sort of structure are these uh, islands which are general purpose with 12 of these um, processes on them. Uh, a load of memory attached to them as well. Um, so you've got on each one of these islands, you've got sort of about 320 kilobytes of uh, low latency SRAM uh, arranged into two different parts of memory. Uh, then also you've got eight megabytes of SRAM on the NIC, uh, two gigabytes of DRAM on the NIC. Um, what we're showing here, sorry about the word salad here on the right hand side. This is just a quick picture just to kind of almost show you guys the process of what happens. We have the packets come in. There's a sort of a system of pre-classification. Um, the packets up to two kilobytes get stored within the CTM, so they're on the island itself to be able to be, do lots of low latency accesses, manage the packets, use them a lot. Um, 
and then they get passed on through to the host. This is obviously the receive path. Um, so uh, on to the next one. So I just wanted to quickly illustrate, you know, what happens when, and show some super, super, super early, super initial benchmarks that need to be taken with, you know, lots of, lots of salt and health warnings. Um, so really what happens when we use BPF um, is we have certain islands which have, uh, which have BPF code on them. So they get used as, um, they can either, so they're used as part of the whole structure. So there are other islands things will pass through. There are, no, sorry, not islands, there are other MEs or FPCs things will pass through. Um, but per um, eBPF FPC, we're looking at about three million packets per second for a write plus redirect. Um, bear in mind there are between 72 and 120 of these on uh, MPU. Um, and 2.8 million packets per second for a read and a write per FPC. Um, that obviously does not scale because we're not going to have one of those. We're not going to have eBPF running on every single one of those. But if we had, let's say, four per island and six islands, that's already a, a pretty compelling case. Um, so this is just to go into the actual FPC and just give you guys some idea of what's on there. Um, You've really got, you've got, so you've got 8K of instruction store. Um, you've got about 128 A registers and B registers. So we have a three operand system rather than a two operand system like x86 or UBPF. Um, and we have um, 60, well, 128 read and 128 write transfer registers, um, as well as 128 next neighbor registers, which you can use as spill or overflow or just gives you a bit more flexibility. The numbers as shown here are per thread. So we have eight cooperatively multiplex threads per each one of these FPCs. So that's how we hide latency. That's how we can make sure that um, memory accesses and so on don't actually cost you cycles. Um, and also another key thing is with the code store, so we've got 8K of uh, instructions which we can store per FPC, but you can actually link up two FPCs together and then you've got 16K of code store. So you can share code stores between different FPCs, uh, which allows you to build much bigger programs. Um, so just to quickly show just some key points about mapping um, eBPF actually to the NFP. Um, you'll notice one of the key things is that we have 32-bit registers and eBPF is 64 bits. So, Here's one of the key things we're going to be talking about, but there's some optimization we can do there. The LLVM compiler tends to push out a lot of ALU64 instructions. We don't actually need those a lot of the time. Um, so we can push them down into 32-bit instructions. It just compresses things. It just gives better performance and just saves cycles. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're going to be looking at when we're doing these mappings. Um, other things that are important are, um, obviously, we'll put the this stack will probably end up in LMEM plus a, maybe a little bit of CLS um, and the maps will push across the other memories. And then we, what we do is you've got a, obviously a sort of caching system uh, to keep things, keep things fast. Um, and my little final little bit is just to quickly just show sort of the programming model. Um, this has been mentioned by I think Daniel, by loads of guys this week, so I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on it. Jakob will go into the details in a sec. Um, but the key thing is just that what we're doing is it's the same path all the way through to the verifier. Um, then we just have our own NFP BPF JIT. Um, we're reusing a lot of the kernel infrastructure, sorry, a lot of the verifier infrastructure that's already there within our, uh, within our JIT. Um, that's motivated some of the recent actions which Jacob will go into more detail of, but it's led to things like the creation of uh, BPF verifier.h um, because that just means we can reuse a lot of the infrastructure. So this is really kind of the, the start. This is the overview. Um, Jakob now will go into sort of the depth and explain exactly what we've upstream so far, what the next plans are, and, and where we're going. Let me see if I can give you this. Are you happy with that one? Awesome. <coughs> Could you turn on the microphone? By um, describing the, uh, the eBPF infrastructure and how it looked before we added our, our extension and our code. So uh, in this diagram on the left, we can see um, the eBPF infrastructure that lives in uh, kernel BPF. Those, that includes the, uh, the BPF system call, 
the verifier, uh, the, the code that performs the, all the modifications and checks and then calls into the, the host JITs. And basically, the, the user space applications will, will use the, this infrastructure to load uh, eBPF programs into the kernel and then use uh, control uh, applications like, which are network specific to, to, pin the, to basically attach the CBPF program into TC. So in TC, it will be CLSBPF or to attach it to, to, to the driver in, in the XDP path. Um, and I mean, this probably doesn't require much explanation. The, the, this is uh, sort of um, the packet path. Uh, obviously, and in XDP, we can do the processing before the SKB is built. For TC, we have to build the SKB, um, and the processing happens slightly later in the stack. Uh, and here, we, we, I'm, I'm showing the, the, in yellow the elements uh, of the stack. <coughs> which we have changed or um, added. So um, starting from the top right, uh, we have extended the uh, CLS BPF uh, with all the elements that are needed for, for the TC offloads. Um, so basically the, the, the skip software, skip hardware flags, um, we have extended the, the TC offload object, which gets passed into the driver. Um, this, is, this is based basically on the work that John's did, John did for U32. Uh, and obviously in the driver we have to, had to add the NDO for the setup TC, um, uh, add some uh, infrastructure to read statistics from the card, and obviously the, the translator as well. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, extended the verifier to be able to reuse the, the in-kernel verifier for our own verification and basically as a basis for, for analysis and, and parsing that we need to do to be able to, to um, translate the eBPF into our machine code. Um, so uh, in this case, um, the control path of, of, the, um, of TC and XDP will be attaching the program. So if the program reaches TC, um, it will be, all the relevant information will be put in the offload object and it will hit the driver. In XDP, obviously the program is attached to the driver directly. So once the, the program reaches the driver, either for the setup TC and DO or is attached to XDP, uh, the driver will uh, attempt to perform the offload, and if everything goes successful, the, the, eBPF, machine, the eBPF program will be loaded on the card, and um, the, packet, the packet path will be in the kernel will basically look sort of like this. So um, I try to show here that the packet goes, um, the packet goes through the kernel without uh, hitting the XDP or TC path, but we are reserving a uh, uh, sort of reserving the rights to, to fall back to the software implementation if we need that. Um, and obviously the, 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 of the statistics module, um, uh, basically using the, same, the infrastructure that I think Amir added for, for Flower, uh, we are reporting statistics to, CC, to TC to uh, populate the action, and basically action statistics. Um, uh, a few words about the, the translation and the verification that we perform. So basically, the first step when we get the eBPF program to the driver is to check if the hardware is capable of performing the offload. Um, and uh, we also read from the card some information about the, uh, about the data path. So that includes um, jump targets and like the maximal image sizes uh, that, that the card can, can accept. And so how many instructions basically can, can be loaded into the data path. Um, and uh, once we read that, we will uh, call into the verifier. So in the verifier, we added um, a new entry point, entry point um, to perform the verification. Uh, the, the problem that we had with the verifier is today the, the standard verification in eBPF is performed together with some modifications. So basically, when user space loads an eBPF program, it will perform verifications. And then using the state that is collected for verification, the verifier will perform modifications, which are basically sort of, uh, as uh, Daniel uh, was talking in his talk, uh, uh, these are uh, changing the offsets for, for the context accesses and, and, and uh, things like that. So, so we had to add a verifier um, entry point, which will just perform the verification and won't do the, the context uh, and other modifications to the programs. 
so, uh, and we also exposed the verifier state so that we can uh, basically from the driver side see what, what the verifier is, uh, is processing. And uh, we uh, give the verifier a callback which, uh, uh, which is invoked per, for every instruction that the verifier traverses. And this way we can basically um, use the verifier to perform driver specific checks. So we, we, find, we, we use that to, to check basically whether the, the program uh, will be, whether we will be able to offload the program, whether the hardware will be capable of handling it. Um, and while the verification is, is being performed, we also collect some metadata about the program. Uh, we uh, collect some per instruction state basically to uh, help us with the translation later. Uh, and once the verification is, is successful, we will do some optimization, uh, generate the image, the machine code, and load it onto the card. So a quick look uh, at, the car, uh, at the sort of device path. Um, as Nick described, the, the, we have multiple uh, processing cores that are dedicated to the eBPF on the card. These are shown here in blue. Um, on the right-hand side, we have the statistics and, and the maps in the card memory. Uh, what I uh, mostly want to concentrate on here is are the, the orange and, and yellow bit, bits uh, in the middle and on the left. Um, so I'm trying to show uh, how the, the packet uh, information is, is populated and handed over to the kernel. Um, basically, the, the, the uh, gray data path in the card on the top, uh, on the bottom left, uh, will perform all the standard uh, processing that are that is needed for the NIC. And at this point, the packet basically has the same state as it would have when it's arriving in the kernel in the RX handler. So invoking eBPF at this point is, is pretty pretty natural, and we have all the information that is needed. Um, but we also want to pass some of the information that the eBPF will produce uh, up into the driver and basically to be able to populate the SKB fields. Uh, and we do that by prepending uh, to the packet uh, basically arbitrary, we can prepend arbitrary metadata. We have a format of, of prepending uh, metadata to the packet and we can, uh, and this is shown in the, basically in the center of the slide, we have the packet and we just push uh, information in front of it and we use that to pass uh, things like the SKB mark for instance today. We also use that for redirections, uh, basically to, uh, when, when there's a redirection done by the eBPF program to a port which is not uh, part of the card, and we will uh, have to pass the if index uh, up to the, the driver and then perform the redirection in the driver. So we use the metadata basically to pass the if index for redirections. Another thing that we'll use this for uh, pretty soon is um, TC return codes. Because um, unlike XDP in TC, the, the packet can show up in the kernel stack uh, in the kernel path for two reasons. It can either be accepted, um, and this is referring mostly to the direct action, direct mode, action mode that, that uh, Daniel was talking about earlier. So where the eBPF program is returning the TC uh, return code uh, directly. And in this mode, we can get uh, basically uh, the packet in the kernel path, either because it's accepted or because the filter didn't match, so, so the code was either okay or unspecified. Uh, and uh, we have to be able to basically uh, or differentiate between the two, so we have to uh, prepend the, the full return code to the packet and, and, and be able to look at it in, in TC later on. Um, uh, and we also have, uh, in the descriptor ring, we have some bits which we can use for to, to mark uh, whether the packet has already uh, been processed by BPF on the card, which enables uh, doing some interesting things with the software fallback in, in, the, in the kernel. Um, a quick uh, overview of the actions and of the uh, things that we basically can perform on the card. Obviously, most ALU operations we have uh, supported right, of, right away. Um, we uh, can do arbitrary packet modifications. We hope to have the basic map support soon. Um, and obviously, we can perform, as I said, uh, operations on the, on the, the packet metadata, um, like RX hash and, and stuff like that because it's already populated by the device data path at the point that we uh, get the, the packet, basically. Um, and on the action side, we can do all the basic uh, XDP actions, so that would be redirection to the port that the uh, packet came in, came from, and drop and, and pass with all the m modifications and the metadata that have been attached. Um, we are only using, we are only doing redirection to the port from which uh, the packet came right now because 
Um, unlike uh, simpler TC offloads, eBPF can be, uh, for eBPF we can't tell at the translation time basically to which part the redirection will happen because the IF index can be looked up from the map or or even computed. So we have to do some form of lookup and we uh, basically translate the IF index into a device port. So we will basically, we have a plan to reuse the maps while, while, well, when we have the maps we'll use the maps to, to map between IF indexes and and, uh, and device ports on the, uh, on at runtime and if there there is a miss basically and the IF index is not on the card as I said previously we'll just fall back to the driver doing the redirection. Um, a few words uh, about the map support. Uh, at, <coughs> at this, as it has been um, said in the morning already, obviously eBPF is a stateful, stateful offload, stateful processing. So um, we are facing here some, some problems which <coughs> Which, which have not been faced before. Uh, basically, uh, if the BPF is, is modifying the state and the kernel data path is modifying the state at the same time, there, there is basically no way for us to, to synchronize this uh, with a reasonable performance. So we have to um, find ways around it. And basically, we have uh, identified three uh, map use cases, like the, the three use cases of maps that we'll be targeting uh, initially. And the first one is a basic read-only map where the eBPF program that we offload is only uh, reading the map. And this will be, this can be offloaded pretty easily by just uh, reflecting all the update operations on the map and keeping like a shadow copy of, of the map in the device. Um, the other use case is when the, there's both reads and updates uh, from the program that is offloaded. And in this case, we'll, we will we'll basically try to um, add a, to the map infrastructure a way of claiming own, uh, uh, ownership of the map so that we can ensure that we are basically, our offloaded program is the only program that is using the map. And then uh, we can just place the map entirely in the device memory. And if any other eBPF program is trying to attach to the map in the kernel data, sp in the kernel space, we'll, we'll just refuse that. and. Um, and because that can cause uh, changes in, in the behavior that may be unexpected to the user, we will only do the read-write uh, offloads uh, when the user is uh, uh, specifically asking for hardware only, so, so setting the skip software, basically the skip software flag in TC. And there are some other interesting use cases which we, can, we, we see uh, here, uh, like, for instance, maps which are uh, written to only with the uh, atomic add operation, but the forwarding is not uh, uh, dependent on the um, on the value that is being updated with the atomic add, which is basically a, a, a statistic use case. Um, one can think about uh, of this as a, a situation where the maps are populated from the user space, but uh, from from either user space or kernel space. But uh, the the offloaded program will perform uh, atomic as on on part of the value. Uh, in the map to to gather stati to, to 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 collect statistics, and this should be uh, possible to to support by basically uh, when the user space is trying to read the statistics uh, to to read the map, just collecting all the copies of the map, both from the kernel space and from the device, and adding the map or just presenting them as if they were uh, per CPU maps. Um, and this should be pretty easy to, this, all those use cases should be pretty easy to identify uh, using the verifier infrastructure that we have in the kernel maybe with, with slight uh, additions. And uh, one, obviously, we can support multiple maps f uh, at the same time. So, so these are just the use cases, but we can have a mix of them for every program that we offload. Uh, and another, the, the other interesting topics apart from map, maps here is uh, obviously the optimizations that we have to do. And because um, eBPF was directed at 64-bit host architecture, so there there's some some space for for doing optimizations. And the most basic one that we have already talked about on the mailing list a little bit was uh, is uh, tracking which operations need only 32 bits of state. 
the, as Nick said, um, uh, the LLVM backend is, is generating only 64-bit ALU operations today, even when they are not needed. So even if we are using U32 uh, variables, the backend will generate U32, uh, will generate 64-bit uh, operations and then basically mask out the upper parts of the registers, which is really wasteful for 32-bit architectures such as ours. Uh, and we would like to, to look at ways or basically uh, converting that, that back into 32-bit uh, logic. And the, the, the big question with this is whether we should try to do this in the kernel by extending the verifier or just trying to push the optimization into a LVM. Uh, doing it in the kernel is, has obvious, obvious disadvantages, but uh, having a more infrastructure for eBPF in the kernel will probably prove useful in the future. So uh, we, we have to um, decide if this is a cost that we are willing to pay. Um, doing it in the LVM is, is, is simpler, but on the other hand, when we do something in the LVM and then we late, uh, later load this into kernel, we can't really trust what the user space tells us. So we have to perform some revalidation later. And this validation, since we don't have the kernel infrastructure very uh, advanced at the moment, would be very simple. So probably if we do LLVM, we would only be able to um, do a sort of all or nothing approach where the program is either 32-bit or 64-bit only, instead of uh, doing the, the, the logic basically per instruction. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that we, we have to think about uh, carefully. Um, uh, this, there are simple in, uh, optimizations that we will definitely look into, and some of them will be, uh, we hope, uh, useful also for the host bits, like basically the fact that we have, uh, the, our machine code is, uh, has three operands, so the, the destination operand is explicit. We can uh, eliminate most of the moves uh, in the eBPF, uh, and we think that if we do it in a generic way, then probably some of the host bits for ARM or for PowerPC and such could be able, should be able to benefit from that as well. Um, uh, we have also on the, on the course, we have some instructions which are optimized for packet processing, like extracting fields from, from headers, um, but that should be a pretty easy optimization which we will definitely look into in the future. Um, that's, that's basically coming down to doing uh, masks, shifts, and, and simple op ALU operations in, in a single cycle uh, on the target. Um, uh, uh, obviously, we have to look at uh, doing uh, some uh, more advanced register allocation uh, for because we have wealth of registers on, on, the, on the device um, and uh, using uh, making better use of the uh, memory architecture that we have, uh, with basi which basically means uh, doing some clever caching uh, of the data that we're reading. And now I'll hand it back to Nick. That's working. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, just to show this is real, we have actually put some demos up. Um, so you can get to the demos via YouTube, or also um, we have, thank you, um, we also have openNFP.org, which is sort of our sort of open website where you can get the SDK. So if you want to play around with the NFP itself um, and do things like that, you can get all that up there. Um, there's also loads of webinars. We've had academics sort of doing stuff over the last year, so there's loads of content up there if you want to check things out. Um, and then just, just to conclude, um, you know, CLS BPF and XDP are awesome. Um, but we feel that we can take some of the things they're doing and push that out of the, uh, push that off CPU uh, and basically save you a bit of money um, and increase the use of offload in good ways. Um, we believe this works as a step in the right direction. There's loads that needs to be done still. Um, and that's pretty much all we have, I think. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Questions? Where can you buy them? <laughs> so the first question was, where can you buy them? Um, if you want to get some to try out, go to openNFP.org. Uh, you can buy them on there, um, so you can pick up a few. Uh, there's also instructions there on how to get this basically all up and running. Um, it's basically going to end up leading to you emailing me uh, for some firmware and stuff, um, which isn't, you know, it's, it's not production ready yet, it's not there yet, but yeah, go on there, uh, grab some cards and we can talk and just basically you'll end up emailing me and we'll send you some stuff. <laughs> um, 
So first of all, I think this this work is super exciting. Um, it's not just not just the potential actually to have this sort of programmability. But what I really like about this is this is a great way to validate uh, the portability of XDP. So I really encourage um, uh, to c continue in that vent. Thank My you. question is, have you looked at what it would take to support either a stateful or quasi-stateful offload? So for instance, something like LRO would be, it seems like a perfect fit for this. Um, but obviously there's going to be some idiosyncrasies about that. Have you thought through those? Do you want to take it? Um, so, so we thought about doing LRO and GRO, and um, we can definitely do that. But that, that, yeah, I mean, reusing basically the same infrastructure. Just as I said, we uh, when we do the image, um, uh, when we generate the code, there there is some parts of the of the gen of the translator which are basically dependent on on on, on information that we read from the card. So it, so the translator is basically ready from for using uh, for, for generating code for different uh, environments, whether it's, it's for XDP, CLS, BPF, whether it's going to be GRO. So I think um, if there is demand, we, we could cheat yeah, we some GRO. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so any plans to go with 64-bit registers? The hardware is going to be like upgraded. Well, <laughs> we asked our yeah. silicon architectures, uh, yeah. architects, and they are not very keen on doing 64-bit for packet well, processing. If, if you write enough angry letters, we can get them to do it. No, no, I mean, this, this hardware is almost designed for BPF. I mean, it's yeah. perfect NPU for BPF. Right. Yeah, no, it, we're, so we're pretty excited. Only, that was the only flaw I saw, 32 bit registers. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is that the programs don't really need the 64 bit logic. I mean, I think it's just the easiest way to do the um, sort of immediate representation in eBPF because the target hosts are 64 bits, so we just do 64 bits. And there are, you know, like uh, in instructions with, with carry in eBPF, so you can't carry, uh, chain to 32 bit instructions to do 64 bit. So the, the default is doing always 64-bit, but when we look at the programs, they, they don't really need 64-bit logic like 99% of the time. Okay, um, Ali, you said that you prepared this metadata before the packet, and I also understand that you need to leave some headroom, so do you leave the headroom and put the metadata before that, or? Yeah, so, um, we basically what is, uh, we had that this, this designed into the the, the 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 sort of receive path for a long time. There's the there's a information in the descriptor that tells you how much metadata is prepended, and then we also have a uh, the firmware is telling the driver how much what's the maximum size of the metadata that can be prepended, and then you can uh, adjust your Rx buffers so that you can always have the space for it, like on the driver side, sort of yeah, be ready for it. Anybody else? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to us.